It's time once again for Closing the Wealth Gap. The one show, maybe the only show that shows you how to close the wealth gap in your own life with the man who's done it for many, our wealth coach himself, Tyrone French. Hey, Tyrone. Paul, hey, how's it going, buddy? How you doing, man? Well, I'm always thinking I'm doing good, and then I listen to your show and I go, "Wait a minute, I'm 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 losing ground. The wealth gap's getting bigger here. I, I thought everything was getting better. I thought we're closing the wealth gap." No, we actually then you, you're going in the wrong direction, my friend. We need to <laughs> we need to we need to close that gap. I know. Hey, hey, you know, and one of the best ways uh, to close the gap when a lot of people are talking about right now is the rising. Uh, consumer price index and to make it a better, you know, just to cons consolidate that word, um, inflation. Yeah. What happened to that? What? Inflation. I, that's a scary word. I remember the 80s and inflation and all of a sudden everything is twice, cost twice as many dollars to buy the same thing. Well, let's put it, let's put, let's put it into a, the proper perspective. Let's say you had a dollar back in 2010. Cause again, people hear that word consumer price index inflation but they don't understand the cause effect relationship of that word and what it's literally doing. I sure don't. I, so, why, why have we lived without inflation? Why does the fed think a little bit of inflation is good? And why are we now scared that we're going to get rapid inflation and everything's going to jump in price? Well, think about the, again, going back to 2010, if you had a dollar back in 2010 and you bought, what that dollar could buy in 2010. Well, fast forward to 2021, you would need $2 to buy that same thing that $1 bought mm -hmm. in 2010. Why is that critical based on the, uh, the consumer price index and inflation? Because wages have been stagnant. Yeah, I keep saying that. And so if, you know, they, and it, people, you know, politicians keep talking about, or some keep talking about having a, a national minimum wage mm -hmm. and, you know, you got pros and cons against it, but what's happening is if the way, if people are not making more money and it's the issue is that the dollar is being devalued, the dollar is worth less and less over time. So if you don't have that orchestrated balance, as far as, um, you know, your the type of investment that you're making that's getting a, a, a nice return on those dollars that's multiplying those dollars. In the future, you have less purchasing power, meaning that if you don't have the money to buy those things, you have to buy less. Now, this is what manufacturers are doing. Manufacturers really don't want to increase the price of their goods and services because they want to increase, they want to scale their business. They want it to grow. So they don't necessarily want to increase their prices because somebody else will lower their price. Mm -hmm. What they're doing is they're cutting back on the goods and services that they offer for that same price. Let me give you a perfect example. You walk into a grocery store and you buy a bag of potato chips yes. and, and on that oh, bag boy. of potato chips, it may say 99 cents or 149 or whatever, but when you open up the bag, you only have a quarter of the product. That's right. All air. It's all puffed up air. And you open the bag and it deflates and there's like, where's the chips? But you know, the thing is, we don't think about, we don't like uh, the Wendy's commercial uh, years ago. It, where's the beef? Remember yeah, that? Right. <laughs> yeah. Where's you know, the beef? They would open exactly. up the, where's the beef? Well, we don't ask ourselves when we open up the potato, the bag of potatoes, where are the potato chips? Mm -hmm. Where are the cookies? Where are the pop tarts? So what they're doing <laughs> is when you open up these packages now, you'll see. You just listed my three lot. favorite foods, by the <laughs> way: potato chips, pop tarts, and cookies. I mean, you, same, uh, same you, here, buddy. Yeah. You know, I got to admit it. You know, you open up my pantry, and you'll you'll see that is well stocked. Yeah. <laughs> but my point is, when I open up that box, uh, I always either smile or I grimace. Yeah. Because I understand what inflation is doing based on the packaging. What they're doing is they're making, they're making the packages larger. And so you're getting the illusion that you're getting more, but when you open it up, there's less inside. And the, the, the issue is we don't question that mm -hmm. as consumers. Okay, I'll tell you one quick funny story. My late father used to bemoan the fact that he had to pump his own gas back in the 70s when that started to become common. There was a time when the little guy came out and pumped the gas for you with a little, little outfit on here. And he exactly. and he said, 
He said, did the price of gas go down when we started pumping it ourselves? No, it went up. He said, those bastards, they got me to do all the work and charged me twice as much. Oh, 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 oh but th when they first started, they had two signs. One was full service yes. and one was self-service <laughs> yeah. or self-serve. And right. so if it was self-serve, you got, you, you did, you got a little bit of a break yes. if you were willing to get out of your car and pump your gas. But as, you know, just like any other norm, when, you know, the longer the, they continued that process, then all of a sudden the, the, they took away the full service, self-service became the norm. And then they, they started charging you more money because why you're hooked on the product. Yeah. Right. You need gas. Right. Uh, you need electricity, you need water, you need all of these things to exist. And they're always trying to find ways to make more money. So they're either going to increase the price or they're going to decrease the products and service. You're going to get less cookies in the box here or both. And that's what my father complained about. They did both. They cut back the service. You got less and they charged more for it. And again, over a period of time, that becomes the norm. I mean, remember this thing about McDonald's. I mean, they used to run commercial. They, they prided themselves on giving change back for a, a hamburger, bag of fries yeah, right. and, a, and, a, and a drink. Right. And, and it was like the person would put their money and they'd, they'd turn around and leave and the guy was, or the woman, whoever was, was at the counter would say, excuse me, sir, your change. Yeah. Ooh, I got change back <laughs> on that $5 or something here. But that's when they started the, where's the beef competitive ad. Yeah. You may do that, but open up the bun. Where's the beef buddy. There's no beef in there. They've shrunk it so much. So why it's like, when you look at what's going on with the federal government now and, uh, these relief packages oh. and people talk about the spending and how big these packages are Trillions. now the, the but see in order to jump start the economy just like uh with a pump you know i grew up in this in the south yes. uh, i was born in alabama uh my grandparents you know lived on this this huge spread and i remember they used to have you know to get water they used to have to pump it Mm -hmm. And so I would, you know, you know, some days we'd be out there as kids running around and all of a sudden, you know, it's hot and you get thirsty and you go over to that pump and you try to pump the water the same way grandma did, but guess what? Nothing came out. Mm -hmm. And so what I had to learn was that, Hey, you got to prime the pump first. Mm -hmm. So you got to take a little, little bit of primer water, put it down in and then start pumping and then wait for that water to come out. And it was some of the best and sweetest water. <laughs> I'll bet. Now you're but, going way back. This is like, you might as well live in the, in the 1800s or something. I've never seen people <laughs> prime a pump. I don't know. What do you know how to a horse, uh, put uh, shoes on horses too and stuff here? I, this is, this is, this is the way back machine. Nobody's ever seen one of those anymore. I remember when, you know, they used to have the cow out there for the milk oh. and the cow had a little salt lick, you know, and it would lick the salt, you know, the whole farm nine yards. <laughs> but my, my, my point is, uh, the economy sometimes require the same thing. It requires priming. Yes. And so you have to put, you have to, you know, in, it's like a huge influx of cash so consumers can start spending again. But here's the question to the coach. So now I'm reading about inflation, this ugly thing I haven't seen in 20, 30, 40 years since the Jimmy Carter years when inflation took off and suddenly everything cost two, three, four times, cars, houses, education, everything. My dollars didn't go up. I didn't make more of them, but everything, they, they, they didn't buy as much, took more of them to buy something. And that fear has been, you know, overwhelming since then. Anybody who grew up in them, sort of like the great depression, the great recession, those inflationary years that wiped out your savings, your savings aren't worth as much. Your salary's not worth as much. And so what we're suddenly afraid of is because we poured so much money in, Everybody's saying, look out, inflation. Talk about that. Are we really looking at inflation and how does that work? Why does that work? It's what it does, Paul, when you flood the economy with, with dollars, with, with, with currency. Right. See, the, the society or the population, really, they confuse currency and money. Hmm. And we need to really define, there's a huge difference between money and currency. So what you're getting now is these Federal Reserve notes, which is a fiat currency, which is backed by, it's not backed by gold or silver. What is backed by a piece of paper. is the good faith of the United States government. But see, the government doesn't pay for anything. It's the taxpayers right. that pay for everything. So the dollar is based on the good faith of 
um, the American people paying their taxes. Mm -hmm. And so that now the IRS can collect, collect those taxes and, and send it to the treasurer and the treasury can send that money out to different programs whereas you keep everything running. But Paul, right. here's the problem. A lot of people will assume that it's, the, that it's the government by itself that's causing the money to be devalued or to lose its purchasing power. I hear that and all the not, time because they're printing too much of it. It's funny money. It's monopoly money. It's not real anymore. It's too much. But it's, it's Paul, but it's really nobody's thinking about the central bank hmm. and the role that the central bank plays as far as when you're looking at uh, currency and it's the banks that's really, it, it's called it's called fractional reserve banking. All that means is that let's, let's say you take a dollar okay. and, or you take a hundred dollars and put it into your savings account. Well, now the bank can literally, your, your account will show a hundred dollars, but they're literally taking $90 and loaning that money out. So they're creating money. Yes. Right. They're creating, they're creating currency out of, out of thin air. So uh, let me stop you for a second because you, uh, you're confusing me and you may be losing some people. So let's just go through this. So you're saying the government says to the bank, here, here's we're going to print some more money. We're going to put some more money in circulation. And then the bank, you put that in the bank because you want it to be safe. You don't stick it in a mattress. And the bank takes 90% of that or whatever, some percent. And they don't just put it in their account. The way they make money is they take your money and reloan it to other people here. And the feds then decide how much they have to keep of that hundred dollars in case of an emergency. Can they loan it all out? And then everybody runs to the bank and says, sorry, we gave it all out. It's not, it's all, none of it's here. How much do they have to keep as a reserve in case people want to run in and get their money back? It's a little bit more, it's, it's a little bit more detailed than that. So let me, let me take it back a little bit. Let me take it just one step back. Okay. Take one step back. Cause I think everybody gets lost if, in all this stuff here. If the, 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 the government issues bonds, which okay. are IOUs, right? Treasury so bonds, these, things the like central that. Central bank, which go, it goes back to the national debt. The central bank will buy these bonds, these treasury bonds, which is, uh, the central bank, uh, which is the fed. Uh, it's the biggest holder of bonds of the federal government. Number one, it's not China. It's, it's the United States. I was heard it was China. I thought they're the ones that are buying up all our bonds, all our promissory notes, all our debt. It, it's the Federal Reserve. Okay. So the Federal Reserve Bank has an account. There's nothing in that account. What they do is they write a check. And so when they write that, they write that check. They're, they're, they're giving all of this money to the United States Treasury so the Treasury can put that money into circulation. Mm -hmm. But the bank do the same thing based on credit and dollars. And, so how, if, and how much they're allowed to lend out, how much the feds regulate, how much they have to keep in hard dollars in the vault, or how much of that they can give out to everybody else, what percentage of your money they have to well, keep. It, it, it varies, the but, the, but the standard percentage is, is 10%. Okay. And so if, but again, you, ha if you got all of this money that's out there circulating again, which is fractional, uh, fractional reserve banking, you got all this money out there circulating, you have IOUs in your account. So you may have $10 physically in the account, but there's a $90 IOU that says that you have a hundred dollars. So that's why, you know, when there's financial, um, uh, uh distress, you don't, if, if everybody went to the bank and tried to get their money out at one time, they couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. That's whatever it's, uh, amen to that. I, I'm, people don't realize the bank isn't just sitting, when you give them the money, you give them a hard dollars or whatever you think, this is what I got, this little pieces of paper and coins. They don't just put them all in the vault and, and, and hold it for you. They take that money and reloan it to other people. So if we all came in at once, it ain't there. At a, but they reloan it at a higher interest rate. Yes, right. That's so how they make now money. That's right. their income producing assets. So they make the on your savings, you may be getting less than one percent. But on that credit, when they're loaning out that money, whether it's a credit card or or a loan, personal loan, business loan, you know, they're getting 10, 15, 20, 30 uh, percent off of it. They're doing well. They're doing well. They're they're not they're not, not hurting hurt. for, yeah. for any any stretch of the imagination. But what happens, Paul, when these and every dollar that is in circulation is earning interest to who 
to the banks. Yeah, not to me. And again, I'm not I'm not mad that at That money's him. not working for me. I give it to them and it works for them. I'm not I'm not mad at them for making money. That's the process. It's our system. It's what we have. Uh, but you have currency and then you have credit. All of this currency and all of this credit causes the money to be diluted, which is again is being devalued. And it, it affects your purchasing power in the future. So if your wages have stagnant, meaning that most people have one source of income, or if it's a husband and wife, uh, you have two sources of income. Nine times out of 10, now that is not enough just to have a decent standard of living. Why? Because of the monetary devaluation or the money has been uh, watered down to where you need more of those dollars. Now let's go one step further. So that's the way the system's been since the 40s or whenever they established the Fed, the 30s or whatever it was. Since 1913. In 1913, that's the way the system's been set up. Wasn't always that way in George Washington's time or other Abraham Lincoln's time, but that's the way it's been since 1913, the Federal Reserve, and everything you just said. But if the Federal Reserve puts too much money in, prints too much, loans too much, uh, infuses too much into the thing, then the theory is what? Everybody's got more money to spend, they all run out and do it, and then supply and demand. Suddenly everybody wants to buy a phone, and I only got so many of them, and there's more customers, then the price goes up. That's it, the illusion. That's, the, that's, see, the, the illusion is, it's the illusion of wealth. Right. The illusion of, of prosperity. When a lot of times that, that sugar high yeah, is really right. credit. They're yeah. using credit as that sugar high. And so the, the, the reason that like, we have these boom and bust cycles. Always. And, and so in that boom and bust cycle, what happens when, it, when you go bust, then the first thing that dries up is credit. Yeah. I, so I found now, that out when I, when I went through my credit problems in the Great Recession and suddenly, you know, I'm in trouble and I almost lost my house and blah, 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 and all these things because I lost my income and uh, my business was suffering. And I couldn't get credit. I said, hey, I've been good for it for 20 years. I had stellar credit. Now the banks were literally calling me up and saying, even though you haven't defaulted, we're taking that credit away. We're exactly. reducing your credit card limit. We're closing your accounts. I'm like, I need the credit now because right. I, I got to borrow some money to cover this, this problem here, this shortage of income. Let me go borrow some. No, no, no. You can't get credit when you need it. Now, I, I'm sorry to say I'm, I don't need any credit. I don't use any credit. I've owned my house forever. I own my car. I've got money in the bank. I've, I've gotten back in better financial terms. And now I get flooded with have another credit card. Let me raise exactly. it. Let me double it. Let me triple. I'm like, I don't want to, I don't use the credit the, cards I got. The best time to try to borrow money from the bank is when you don't need it. That's the insanity of it. That's the insanity of it. When <laughs> I needed it, they wouldn't give it to me. When I don't need it. That's the business model because you're less of a, you're less of a risk. Right. But Paul, again, what happens is when you when they start tightening it down on credit and the, the, the money supply, people's the dollars stop, they're not it's called velocity. They're not circulating as fast. Yeah, right. Then people stop spending money. And if they stop spending money, what happens to those prices? Those prices start start to come down. So again, it's a cause and effect relationship. But what I'm telling my viewers is that inflation is not gonna go away. Based on our monetary system. Which is which is not changing anytime soon. No, you're always going to have these boom and bust cycles. So the way that you have to uh, that you have to, to 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 balance that out is by either increasing your income mm -hmm. or decreasing your expenses. And that go that goes to managing. You have to get to the point where you're managing your finances to whereas just like a business wants to scale or businesses, uh, they invest in research and development so that they can continue to grow. And but add how do I increase, this is the fundamental problem for 99% of the people listening to this. I, I, I kind of get what you're saying. I see this is this complicated system. I'm not sure I understand all of it, but you make it clearer to me. And you keep saying, increase your income. I can't, my job pays this. What do I go get a bigger job, a better job? Do I quit my job? I, I want to hold on to my job. 
I beg for a raise. I uh, work harder hours, uh, uh, but my income is pretty fixed. I can't do much about it, or so I think. You know, there was a, um, a great business philosopher. His name was uh, Jim Rohn, you know, rest in peace. Mm -hmm. But one of his mentors, uh, you know, he had the same argument. So, you know, you know uh, I don't, my job, you know, won't pay me, you know, more money. And it's like, you know, this is my paycheck. This, this is all I get. Right. And so his mentor said, well, you know, are there other people at that where you work? Are they making more money than you? And he had to admit, he said, yes. He said, so that's not all they pay. That's all they pay you. <laughs> yeah. So it's, yeah. it's based on if your service or your value is limited, then your income structure is limited. And that case, case in point, if you, if you're, and again, I'm not, I'm not putting down um, baggers at grocery stores, but what I'm saying is that if you're the bagger at a grocery store and your, your function is to take the product and put it into the bag, then they're going to pay you based on what that, that's what it would cost to replace you. Mm -hmm. uh, a brain surgeon will make more money uh, in an hour then an um, uh, auto mechanic could make, you know, because he's day. got a rare skill, and uh, I need that brain surgeon. A bagger, I can get anybody to do. And so it goes back to it goes back to your skill set, Paul. The reason you can you can start making more money by changing certain skill sets and doing or adding certain things. And let me tell you, the federal government, United States government, would would rather for you to become an independent contractor or start a, start your own small business as an entrepreneur than just having you to work on a job and to receive really? a paycheck. You think they would want, not want that because paychecks are supposed to be predictable and forever and an uh, entrepreneur is up and down and risky? Well, if, as an entrepreneur, uh, you, you really literally can become a employer. And now you're employing people that yeah, are paying true. that are paying income tax, creating more jobs, right? Creating more jobs. I mean, that's why a lot of people get get breaks based on real estate because they're they're, they're solving a problem. They're create they're they're providing housing, and so the government will give them a tax break because they're providing housing. So let me ask you the question as we come to the end of today's show here: What do you look into that crystal ball? That's what we're really hoping to hear today here this talk of inflation in the air everywhere you go, they've put in too much money into the economy, uh, too many people are running out to buy stuff, it's gonna drive prices up, it's already driving prices up, gas has gone up, food's gone up, uh, because of the short supply, we were all shut down for a while and now we're opening and there's not enough stuff, so is this a short-term production problem and that's why prices have gone up, or is it a long-term inflation risk, which many worry about, which means that my precious savings is going to be worth less. It's always going to be an inflation problem because of the system. And so over a period of time, I mean, let me, put, let me ask you a question. Do you think taxes in the future are going to go up or do you think they're going to go down? <laughs> they're going to go up. They're going to go up from the short run for and sure. Look at, you, so you look at the trend. You look at the trend based on, let's see, your, the trend is your friend. So if you go trend back from, look, okay. you know, go back 10 years from now, versus now it's been a steady and now it, it vacillates, it goes up and down, mm -hmm. but the, but the trend is that it's conti going to continue to go up mm -hmm. just like the monetary devaluation, the, the price of the dollar is going to continue to decline. So you're going to have to have more dollars in the future. So what I don't want people to focus on are the results. Because when you talk about higher gas prices and food prices and all these things, those are results. Mm -hmm. I want them to focus on the cause. And so there's a word that I want people to start using. That okay. word is synergy. Synergy. Okay. Synergy. synergy. I want people to understand that you, you, you're you going to have to pair up. It's like if you were trying to make it with one income mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, all of, all of a sudden now you have two incomes. That makes life a whole lot easier. Yeah. And then if you add a third income, it makes it a whole lot easier. And so look at like having a, uh, a rope that has uh, one strand. And that rope was limited based on that strand until you added another strand. 
That's true. Get and stronger, it gets stronger. thicker. Yeah, right. And then you, you added another strand. Now you got a three strand rope and it'll do way more than that one strand. But that process of that rope coming together is called synergy. Hmm. And so I want people to start thinking and, and look up that word, Google that word, um, and, and, and get that word in your lexicon and just start thinking about, forget about the result as far as these are the problems and everything that's going on. I want you to just, just think synergy, not energy, but synergy. And what do I, what forces do I have to have to come together to help me to, as, as a business owner, we're always talking about scaling, mm -hmm. you know, growing your business. What are, what forces have to come together for me to increase my income? That's the key. You know, you keep harping that you talk about second incomes, the gig economy. I got a part-time job. I got a, I got a business that uh, produces not uh, a passive r r income. It just provides income to me. I don't have to put much effort into it because I own that asset. It continues to make money for me or, or, or a business or whatever. Mm -hmm. I think that's, a, that's the focus of the future because we can't seem to change the system. We can't, taxes are gonna go up, the dollar's gonna buy less. It's just built, baked into the system here. So all we can do is stay ahead of this inflation by increasing our skills to get higher paid jobs or increasing the synergy, the strands in our economic income package here. Because once you start focusing on, focusing on synergy, you're gonna start asking yourself, how can I increase my service today? See, how can I increase my service today? Because it's that increase of service that is going to, do, and, and adding more value, that's going to increase your income. So it's like the bagger. If he takes it out to the car, then he gets a tip. Absolutely. And, and that's how people need to start thinking. How do I increase my service? How do I increase my value? And once you're on that track and you're thinking about that every single day, then you will have a, your mindset your mindset will begin to shift. You would have that paradigm shift. And then you'll start seeing opportunities that were always there that you just never took advantage of. If people need some coaching on this, if they need some training, if they need some accountability, I said, I'm going to do it, but I didn't do it. I say you get a coach, right? That's what professional athletes do. Well, do that's you, the synergy part of it. Do we know that's any uh, coaches <laughs> out there who can help teach me this? I wish it says coach on your cap. Uh, do you know any coaches? I, you know, I, I, this is one guy I keep hearing it. He wrote this book called closing the wealth yeah, gap. Where is this he, guy? He got this, <laughs> he's got this website, uh, closing the wealth gap dot us. Oh, and by the way, I find, he also has an app. And right <sighs> now, the only thing you have to do is text Tyrone to three, six, two, six, zero. And is. his entire business is literally in the palm of your hand. Talk about and an extra now, service. You added an extra service to what you're doing. I, 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 I don't have to just call you or email you. I, I'm, you're in the palm of my hand every time. Paul, the, again, going back to that word as far as synergy and increasing the service. How can I increase my service today? That's how I brought, that's how the book came into existence or the creation. It started out as an idea or a thought. It manifests itself into this, this book, hard copy, soft copy. My website is just an extension of me increasing my service. Mm -hmm. My app is an extension increasing my service. So in the day, back in the day, you had these business cards and you would pass your business card or give your business card to somebody nine times out of 10, it ended up in a trash can. Yeah, right. But now everybody has a phone. And so now they get your away. website, they're right there at your website. And then they when they go there, what do they say, well, I got to have content then. I got to have stories. I got to have information. I got to have webinars. I got to have training. I got to have podcasts. I got to have all this content to fill up this this connection, this communication channel. Even on my app, there's a button that goes that links my clients directly to the podcast. See, how do you, how can I increase my service, increase my value and going back to Jim Rohn and his mentor. And he said, this is my paycheck. This is. You know, I need more money, but this is all they pay. And again, I, it, it just, re, it stuck with me. His mentor said, you know, that's what they pay you. They're paying other people way more money than that. Somebody so when said, you want to increase your income, think about increasing your value. And how can I increase my service today? Which goes back to that one word. If you don't get anything out of this podcast today, I want you to think about that word synergy. Okay.
All right, I will. I'll go look it up because that's that sounds like one of those mysterious words I hear floating. Around. We had synergy. I don't know what synergy is. And here's the thing, Paul. I used to give people. I used to try to give people all the answers. Yeah. And you can't do that because you there, there's nobody on this planet that you can change. <laughs> Not one. Yeah. Yeah. People have to want to change. They have to change themselves, and so they have to have skin in the game. And if you're giving them all the answers, they have no reason to get into activity. Mm -hmm. Because what they'll do is in their mind, they'll visualize and they'll fantasize and they'll create all these scenarios why this won't work. Yes. Versus getting the information, applying that information, having a certain level of success and saying, wow, yes, this, this, this works for me. This works. This works. So it starts by taking, it starts by learning and listening and then starts, then you got to put it into action. You have to put it into action. There's, the, there's a movie called The Secret that was out. It was very popular. Oh, and I yeah. know we, we were short on time. We got to go. But this, you know, they were talking about the law of attraction. And but the only fault in that movie, because the law of attraction is real. Mm -hmm. It's a thing, just like gravity. But what they were, they, they, the, the step that they missed, they had the thought process in mind. They had the feeling. But they didn't talk about the action or the activity. No. And without that, you don't have any growth. You don't have you don't have the manifestation. It's not going to happen. I can't just think about planting. I got to put some seeds in the ground. Oh boy. And then I got to water them once in a while. <laughs> well, keep coming back cuz this is how we plant some seeds in your head and how we're going to water them in your life here. Tell us how we get in touch with Tyrone French, the wealth coach. I want you to text Tyrone to 36260 or you're going to go to my website closingthewealthgap.us. Okay, it's that simple. If you can take that step, then you're halfway there, closing the wealth gap. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Paul. That's our show for this week, Closing the Wealth Gap. The one show, the only show that shows you how to take control of your financial future. Right here in Orange County's only community radio station, OCTalkRadio.net.